So the so the uh, in a, <coughs> the indecency wars go on. Um, we reached the point of Fox Television, the um, two-time Supreme Court consideration of the FCC's fleeting expletives uh, enforcement. Um, you remember Bono and Nicole Ritchie and Cher coming out with uh, dirty words uh, blurted out on television uh, and the FCC uh, sanctioning the networks that aired them. Well, Fox Television said enough is enough and they challenged the FCC's authority to enforce the indecency policy in this way. Uh, instead of what the FCC had done in the past, as in Pacifica, for example, uh, was enforce the indecency, the indecency law uh, only for deliberate and repetitive uh, dirty words. Um, but with the Bono Chair Ritchie uh, events, they decided that fleeting expletives, one time dirty words, would be enough to just justify a fine. Uh, and that was a big shift in the FCC's position and caught the broadcasters by surprise. And Fox Television contended in the case against the FCC's policy that the FCC had acted arbitrarily and capriciously in changing its policy without any good reason for changing its policy, uh, ambushing the broadcasters, and that that was in violation of the Federal Administrative Procedures Act, which governs all uh, administrative agencies and requires them to act more or less rationally, not arbitrarily and capriciously. Fox Television also challenged the FCC's uh, enforcement as a violation of the First Amendment. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals decided that um, the shift in policy did violate the Administrative Procedures Act uh, and therefore was unlawful, and the broadcasters shouldn't have been sanctioned for airing these expletives. Uh, but the Second Circuit didn't reach the First Amendment question. Didn't have to. Had already decided for the broadcasters. That's a perfectly appropriate thing for the court to do, to decide the case on non-constitutional grounds rather than get into the constitutional thicket. <coughs> Well, the FCC took the case of the Supreme Court, which <clears throat> decided in 2009 that the FCC had not violated the Administrative Procedures Act, and what they had done in shifting their policy was, quote, rational. Justice Scalia writes the opinion for the court, and he pussyfoots around what was really at stake, refusing to use the words, instead using the euphemisms F-word and S-word, um, and responding to the Court of Appeals point that the government had not shown that being exposed to these words um, inflicted any actual harm on children who might be in the listening audience. Scalia said, well, there's some things that you can't really expect to get empirical evidence of. How could you construct a study in which kids, a, a controlled group of kids, was subjected to dirty words and another group of kids was never su subjected to dirty words and see what effect it had? It's enough, Scalia said, to know that children mimic the behavior they observe and programming replete with one word indecent expletives will tend to produce children who use one word indecent expletives. So the majority of the court ruled in the FCC's favor uh, and Justice Thomas wrote a very interesting concurring opinion, um, agreed with Scalia that as a matter of administrative law, uh, the FCC was within its rights to change its policy, but argued that the FCC's constitutional authority to regulate indecency didn't exist because Red Lion and Pacifica were wrong. They were wrong when they decided and they're even more wrong now. Why were they wrong? Well, as you might predict from a Thomas opinion, uh, the original meaning of the Constitution was at stake. And you can't discern the original meaning by looking at, as Red Lion and Pacifica did, at transitory facts such as the scarcity of radio frequencies and so on. The meaning of the Constitution, he says, cannot turn on 20th century conditions. And if given an opportunity, um, Thomas clearly would, he said, reconsider Red Lion and Pacifica. That's code for saying he would overrule the decisions. Um, spectrum scarcity is no longer a factor, nor is broadcast uniquely pervasive, as the court had said in Pacifica, at least as compared to cable <coughs> and satellite and the internet. Well, uh, not having decided the constitutional question, the Supreme Court remanded the case to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals to decide that. That had been left open by the Court of Appeals initially, and it was left open by the Supreme Court, which ruled only on the statutory question. So this went back to the Second Circuit, which went uh, whole hog and decided not simply that the fleeting expletives policy was unconstitutional, but that the entirety of the, <coughs> the FCC's indecency policy violated the First Amendment. It was overbroad. It was vague. Uh, it was impossible to... Um, apply it and enforce it consistently. And the Court of Appeals pointed out many of the instances in which the FCC either sanctioned a broadcaster for airing something or didn't. Um, perhaps most famously, uh, it did not sanction uh, the broadcasters that aired the movie Saving Pri Private Ryan, which probably has in the first 10 minutes more of George Carlin's dirty words than Carlin ever uttered in his lifetime. I mean, it's just relentlessly, it's repetitive, it's deliberate in movie making. But the FCC gave them a pass because it said, well, in context, um, this was necessary to the reality of what the invasion during war was like and what soldiers' lives were like and so on. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, the FCC sanctioned another broadcaster for uh, allowing the use of the very same words in a documentary about musicians. So how can they possibly uh, justify doing, uh, making the distinction between those two? Um, well, the case went back to the Supreme Court uh, after the Second Circuit found that the entire indecency policy was a violation of the First Amendment. And last June, uh, the court decided that case on the merits, on the First Amendment question, but the court ducked the very question that had been debated through the courts, thoroughly briefed, and squarely presented to the court. They did not decide the First Amendment question at all. Instead, the court decided that 
the FCC's action in sanctioning the broadcasters was a violation of their due process rights. Due process in the procedural sense, which gives everybody who's about to be uh, penalized by government the right to fair notice that what you're doing might result in a penalty and to be heard before you're penalized. Uh, notice and hearing are the fundamentals of due process of law. Well, the court in uh, Fox Television 2 decided that the um, FCC had basically ambushed uh, the broadcasters because at the time the Cher and Ritchie uh, uh, expletives were aired, uh, the FCC had not given notice that it had actually changed its policy and that fleeting expletives were now punishable. Uh, so the Supreme Court, in Kennedy opinion, decided that um, uh, there was a violation of due process and it was unnecessary to address the fundamental First Amendment issue, uh, which of course left the indecency policy undecided and left everybody in the dark. Broadcasters don't know what they can do uh, in the way of airing indecent material. One of the issues, by the way, in, uh, in the decision last year was an episode of LA, not LA Law, uh, NYPD Blue, an old, when it was on the air, which aired about seven seconds, I think, of uh, the nude buttocks of a female actress. Uh, not in a sexual situation at all, but the nudity alone was considered indecent by the FCC. Uh, and who knows whether that is um, now going to result in sanctions or not. Um, the Justice Ginsburg concurred in the court's uh, decision on the due process point, but she would have gone, like Thomas would have gone, she would have gone back to the roots of all of this and overruled Pacifica and Red Lion, which she said were wrong from the beginning. Uh, and the time and technological advances in the Commission's untenable rulings show that the policy itself is unconstitutional. And she, uh, perhaps playfully, cited as authority in her concurring opinion, Justice Thomas's concurring opinion in Fox Television 1. Um, but Thomas himself uh, ducked everything and didn't say anything at all in Fox Television 2. Uh, he simply joined in the Scalia opinion for the majority. Uh, then we come to uh, Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction uh, at the halftime show at the Super Bowl, where she's singing a song with Justin, what's his name? Tim Timberlake, yeah. Um, and uh, he ripped off her bustier, or whatever that's called, uh, briefly, just a few seconds. Uh, and CBS was fined $550,000 uh, for this. Um, F uh, CBS contested the fine, the sanction, and uh, the Court of Appeals, I think it was the Third Circuit in this case, that's, they sit in Philadelphia, uh, decided that the FCC's action was arbitrary and capricious. Couldn't be defended in a rational way, violated the law. Didn't reach the First Amendment question. Uh, but the FCC took the case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court denied certiorari in the case. Um, didn't have to reach it. it. That was two days after they had decided Fox Television. Uh, so they, in their view, had laid out the law in Fox Television, and they didn't have to deal with the merits of the Janet Jackson episode. But look at Justice Rob, Chief Justice Roberts' concurring opinion. He, he takes the opportunity to, to write a concurring opinion on the denial of certiorari, which is fairly unusual. Uh, and in his opinion, he warns broadcasters, OK, now you know. Uh, it's not arbitrary and capricious from now on, because you're on notice that a fleeting expletive or a fleeting image, as in the Janet Jackson situation, uh, is sanctionable by the FCC. It is now, he says, it is now clear that the brevity of an indecent broadcast, be it word or image, cannot immunize it from FCC censure. Any future wardrobe malfunctions will not be protected on the ground relied on by the court below. Well, we have a real recent episode of a fleeting expletive that Nico uncovered and is about to tell you. Hmm. Could they have punished whoever broadcast that, um, consistent with the First Amendment? Well, who, who did broadcast it, actually? I think, I think it was Fox. I, don't know uh, I tried to find out, and uh, it for sure was carried on cable. It was carried on the Major League Baseball thing on cable. And apparently not carried on any broadcast channel. Does that make a difference? Yeah. Certainly does. Because if it's purely on cable, the FCC, FCC does not regulate. The content does not enforce the indecency policy uh, against cable. Um, it doesn't regulate the content of cable. Sorry? It was apparently on radio. Yeah, this was the ceremony be was before the game, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it was probably broadcast. It was probably picked up. But it would have been on radio. Does that matter? Yeah, it's broadcast. It's over the air. That's within the FCC's jurisdiction to enforce its indecency policy. Uh, but then the chairman, the outgoing chairman who has announced his resignation, Janikowski, uh, tweeted, uh, I stand with Big Poppy, that's uh, Ortiz's nickname, I stand with Big, Big Poppy and Boston, which make, will make it difficult for the FCC to sanction whoever put that on the radio. Uh, and it's illustrative, I think, of how ridiculous this policy is. Uh, and, you know, they don't enforce it against um, cable or satellite, and they think it would be unconstitutional to do so. They don't have the constitutional authority to do so. That constitutional authority comes from Red Lion and Pacifica. Um, and they can't argue that there's a, with regard to 
uh, cable and, and satellite, uh, that there's any spectrum scarcity. That doesn't come into play at all. Uh, there's no history of government involvement in the medium, allocation of frequencies and regulation of the content and so on, the way there was uh, in the early cases. And there's really no need for a viewpoint diversity because everything's out there with the internet now, and all points of view can be heard, and there's really uh, little point to enforcing this indecency law anymore. But that's it, um, and I suppose you have to know about it. Uh, the regulation of cable, uh, cable was a new medium. The issue went to the Supreme Court on what First Amendment analysis should scrutiny should be applied to the cable medium. The cases were both named Turner Broadcasting, no relation. The uh, issue in the cases was whether uh, broadcasters, I mean the cable operators, could be required by the government, by act of Congress, to carry the signals of broadcast stations. Um, it was called the must-carry obligation. Uh, and the broadcasters had lobbied Congress to pass this law to save their economic skins. They saw that cable was growing by leaps and bounds, and more and more people got their television through cable rather than over the air. But, they argued, the cable operators had both the power and the incentive to harm broadcasters and put them out of business. They had the power in the sense that they had what, the, what they called bottleneck control over what cable subscribers could see. And the cable operator could refuse to carry a broadcast station not have it on the menu at all, or uh, move it around in ways where viewers couldn't find it. Uh, you know, we might have had, uh, you might be channel five for the last 60 years, but next week we're moving you to channel 17, and after that to channel 102, and we can't tell you where you're going after that. Well, it would destroy the broadcaster's business. So that cable operators had the power to harm broadcast, and they also had an incentive in that they both compete, cable and broadcast, for the same advertiser's dollars, uh, commercials. And so it was, a hard question for the court in the cable cases, the Turner Broadcasting cases, what First Amendment scrutiny to apply. One of the immediate questions was, is this law content-based? And the plurality of the court decided that it wasn't, that it was content-neutral. Even though in Congress, the Congress people who were debating the law clearly wanted by this um, must-carry provision to preserve, for example, uh, public television stations, Sesame Street. They clearly wanted to um, include local news, broadcast news. Uh, and despite the fact that they wanted that content, and that's what motivated them to pass the law, the plurality of the Supreme Court said it's content neutral. Uh, but then because of the characteristics of the cable medium, the bottleneck control that they had, uh, the court decided that they couldn't treat um, cable operators the way they had treated broadcasters with that relaxed scrutiny applicable to, to broadcasters from Red Lion. So they applied intermediate scrutiny, uh, a concept that you are now intimately familiar with. Uh, and that's, how, that's where they come out, came out on cable. But if it's broadcast, uh, that's the most relaxed scrutiny. That's the easiest for the government to regulate. Cable is next. Uh, and then there's all the rest of the media, uh, including the internet, which we'll get to soon. But um, let's look at an entirely different medium uh, that teaches a couple of lessons, uh, starting with phone sex. And the, the court was required to decide what to do about phone sex when the government passed a law that attempted to put dial-up porn, as they call it, completely out of business. Senator Jesse Helms, who was sort of a soulmate of uh, uh, the Reverend Jerry Falwell, remember from the Hustler case, uh, got the Congress to pass a law that made it a uh, felony crime uh, to put indecent material on the telephone medium for commercial purposes. That is, you could say shit to your little brother on the phone, um, but if it was on, for commercial purposes that you put up dirty words, then um, you would violate the law. And there were various kinds of, there may still be, I don't check this, uh, various kinds of dial porn operations. There would be live chat where people could call a 900 number and, uh, and talk live with somebody, talk dirty. Uh, and then there were recorded messages. They could dial 900 number and listen to a recorded uh, sex message of some, some kind. All of that was um, illegal. Uh, and of course, the phone sex industry challenged the law as unconstitutional. Uh, the law prohibited uh, not just indecent material over the phone, but obscene material, indecent or obscene, or maybe it was obscene or indecent, but both were prohibited. Uh, and the case went to the Supreme Court, which decided that um, indecent speech, not obscene speech, indecent speech is protected among adults, that we grown-ups have the right to use indecent language if we wish. Um, the, the reason for this law, Senator Helms, said was to protect children, minors, from exposure to indecent language, but his law prohibited, without qualification, any indecent material for commercial purposes on the phone, whether kids were involved or not. Um, and the Supreme Court declared that indecent speech is protected by the First Amendment among adults. This was a content-based law, and therefore the court quite properly applied strict scrutiny. The court found that the government has a compelling interest in protecting children from exposure to indecent language on the telephone, but then as the court always seems to do, uh, went on to the narrow tailoring point.